Welcome to the February 27, 2020 Data Science Colloquium in the College of Arts and Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. Our speaker today is Jennifer Hennel from the University of Alberta, who is one month away from her final PhD defense and whom we elected in Kyoto uh, at the International Cognitive Linguistics Conference as the lone outstanding international emerging researcher um, for our organization. Jennifer will be speaking today on language in the body, quantifying the multimodal signal in spontaneous discourse. Jennifer. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction and also for the invitation to join you. I believe my defense is under a month. I won't tell you the exact number of days. <laughs> uh, I have been able to join the um, colloquium series once or twice and have enjoyed some of the videos that have been posted afterwards. Uh, so I'm delighted to be speaking with you all today. I want to start just, uh, you know, context is everything and to locate myself in physical space, not only in cyberspace. Um, I'm at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, which is um, a fairly northern city. U of A is one of Canada's top five research universities, and this is about what my building looks like today. <laughs> okay, so I know that uh, in the colloquium series earlier in January, Mark introduced the Red Hand Archive, so many of you will be familiar with it. I work with the Red Hand Archive in my research. It has really been a tremendous resource uh, and has allowed me to pursue a large part of my research program, which as Mark said, is all about how to quantify the multimodal signal. So I think about this as the contribution of the body to language in spoken interaction. So spontaneous, that just everyday language use, you're talking to somebody in the hallway and trust me, you're not doing it without moving your body. <clears throat> so. This is the part of the research, my research program that I'll, I'll share with you today. So to begin, I just wanna dive right into some data to introduce the kind of phenomena that I'm looking at. So here, what I'm showing you is uh, three different uh, snippets from three different conversations. And on the left-hand side, you'll see that um, this is kind of the preceding moment from the one that I'm interested in. Okay, so the speaker is trundling on in their, in their conversation. The right-hand moment is the one after the one I'm interested in, and so I'm drawing your attention to the one in the middle. And here at this moment, in each of these three conversations, the speaker is saying, but anyways, and doing a gesture like this. So, but anyways is a chunked discourse marker uh, that express, expresses essentially the speaker's relationship to what's just come before. You'll see that kind of iconic pushing away action. Um, so it's, it's doing two things. It's distancing from the previous discourse and, and it's pivoting into the next step in the conversation, if you like. And so this is the kind of just broadly speaking, this is the kind of co-speech behavior is what it's called um, that I'm looking at. So it includes the hand waving that I'm doing and that these people are doing and things like head tilts, shoulder shrugs, eyebrow movement, all of the meaningful body movement that happens in conjunction with spoken language, essentially. So this is a bit of a roadmap for where we'll go in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. I'm going to back up and give you a little bit of context about the research. I'm not going to go deeply into the linguistics of things, um, but, I, but you need to have some understanding of the uh, kinds of uh, linguistic phenomena that I'm looking at, because that informs, obviously, my research questions. And then I'll spend most of the time on uh, how I use recent advances in data science, such as the Red Hen Archive and 3D Motion Capture, uh, to explore my, the multimodal signal. And then we'll, I'll close with a, a bit of a plus minus and my ideas about why this is important and what the implications are, both for linguistics and for applications beyond linguistics. Uh, and uh, we'll have time for some discussion, which I'm looking forward to. So to give you the very broad uh, strokes here of where my research is situated. Uh, in the 1980s in linguistics, there was a turn in the study of language to look at what, towards what essentially became cognitive approaches to language study. And that was characterized by um, 
looking at language in the everyday, not no longer looking at idealized forms, uh, but rather everyday language use, which included figurativity and idiom and metaphor and those kinds of um, characterizations or those kinds of tools in language. Um, and it also uh, was tied to developments in the embodied cognitive sciences, which showed really how deeply involved the body is in language processing. That's a whole, uh, you know, another area of research. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, but we can certainly talk about, um, you know, what that evidence is later if you'd like to. The last two decades have really seen two more significant shifts um, to, or two additional significant shifts. The first about 20 years ago was kind of a marriage or integration of corpus studies and corpus methods into this cognitive study of language. And what that did was take this, uh, operationalize the commitment to usage. So you could look at large amounts of real kind of text data um, and process it. But notice that I said text. So these corpora are generally text-based. Even if it, the, the language uh, was recorded, it's transcribed into text form and analyzed in text form for the most part. So that's one of the biases towards textual data. But corpus methods allowed us to look at how language patterns or how it chunks. So you could uh, investigate, for example, collocational patterns. Here, uh, the screenshot is just um, a quick corpus look at on the one hand, and the point is just that you can um, isolate a target utterance and see what the linguistic context is on either side. So linguists were interested with in whether verbs always occurred in the first person, for example, you know, so think is characterized by, you know, being used in the first person and how chunks of language uh, really can be identified. This decade, uh, on the other hand, and kind of the last 10 years has seen an increased commitment to, so taking this language in use, this commitment to language in use and moving that into language in use in interaction. Nick Enfield uh, talks about conversation as being kind of the, the soul or where, where language lives and breathes. And uh, Mark has talked about ecologically real language. So we're really prioritizing face-to-face -face conversation as a locus of linguistic analysis. Of course, as soon as we're talking about face-to-face -face interaction, we have to include the body. So you can't strip the body out of linguistic production. I mean, I could sit on my hands here, but um, <clears throat> it's usually involved. We have those stripped it out for the most part from linguistic analysis. There are subfields, I don't wanna, that's not a global statement. There are subfields that have uh, like conversation analysis and gesture studies that have looked at conversational phenomena. Um, but these have generally been dominated by qualitative studies. <clears throat> so there's still a lag at doing interactional work at a corpus level. And this is really where my research fits in. So I use multimodal data and corpus methods to study language in interaction. So that's both the linguistic part of the signal and the kinesic part of the signal. So the, the, my main research questions are really looking at the form and nature of co-speech behavior. So I ask whether there are co-speech behaviors that regularly align with specific linguistic utterances or conceptual structures. And I'll give examples of those in a couple minutes. If, if that is the case, what yeah, form do these behaviors take? Um, and to, sure, no. No. Sorry, someone asking a question? That's okay. Nope, okay. So, Galaxy Note 9, if you want to ask a question, send me something in chat and then I'll interrupt the speaker at the right moment, okay? Go ahead, Jennifer. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so once, once we have an idea of what the form these behaviors take, I'm also asking um, to what degree there is a conventionalization of that form. So, um, you know, do we have that, that uh, um, a multimodal signal 60% of the time that we use an utterance, uh, is it higher, is it lower? So I'm looking at, at quantifying the, the degree of um, enactment um, and I'll, I'll get into how I, how I do that in a moment. From a methods perspective, I'm also looking at um, trying to drill down into what are the meaningful variables that we need to capture in specific conceptual and linguistic domains. And I'll talk more about how the variables that we're capturing need to be tied to the uh, you know, type of, of linguistic utterance that we're looking at because the meaning informa meaningful information is gonna sit in different places in the body depending on the kind of domain. 
And then more broadly, what systems or tool sets do we still need to kind of develop um, to accelerate multimodal research? So in my work, as I said, I use red, the Red Hand Archive and motion capture data. I have used the corpus, the, sorry, the corpus of Contemporary American English, or COCA, um, as a proxy for Red Hand. So when I want to really drill down into a specific utterance, I use the tagged corpus uh, because it facilitates um, that kind of uh, collocational work that uh, I talked about earlier. But for the multimodal signal, what I'm using is Red Hand and motion capture. In Red Hand, what we can do is search for specific utterances and annotate interactional behavior. And what my goal is there is to build a multimodal profile. So to really have an understanding of this um, kind of dual signal, I mean, multi-signal um, uh, utterance. And with motion capture, we combine the manual annotations and the motion capture traces uh, to do linguistic work and um, I'll also introduce you to some work that we're doing to improve automated pattern analysis in motion capture streams. Okay, <clears throat> so this is where it's gonna get linguistic-y for a moment uh, because before getting into how I uh, use each of these methods, we'll take a, a brief look at these linguistic domains that I keep talking about. Excuse me, I have a cold. Okay, so the three kind of large uh, conceptual or linguistic domains that I look at are aspect, contrast, and discourse. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how these are, uh, differentiate from each other. So if we take aspect, uh, the very Coles Notes version of this is that aspect has to do with um, ways in which um, the temporal contour of an event can be construed. So in my uh, little screenshot here, um, the event is a door closing event. Uh, you can see that the person is in the process of closing the door, but the ogre gets in the way, stops the door closing event from being completed, um, and whether or not they make it out of the closet is up to you <laughs> to imagine. Um, but the important thing here is that this event is construed as incomplete or unbounded, so the linguistic utterance might go something like, she was closing the door when the ogre stuck their fingers out or something. Um, by contrast, if the ogre wasn't there, it would be a completed event and the door would be closed. She closed the door. Okay, so mission accomplished, the door is closed. So that kind of distinction um, where an event is open and can be interrupted or it's bounded and closed is, a spectral, is an aspectual distinction. And what I do in my work is look at how, for aspect marking, how a specific set of verbs that all have different aspect a spectral profiles of how these are enacted in the body. So the verbs that I look at are these, these five, continue, keep doing something, start doing something, stop and quit. And like I said, I explored the multimodal profile or identified a multimodal profile for each of these. Um, and these are inherently, this is an inherently grammatical phenomena, aspect that is. And then, so that was kind of my first set of work and I just looked at gesture and the screenshot there is from a motion capture study I did and you can see that that is a gesture associated with an ongoing event that has um, kind of no segmentation in it. It's a nice prototypical arc gesture. From there I moved to two domains, contrast and discourse, which are less grammatical and more highly stanced. So contrast is inherently about the evaluation of two things. Okay, this is frequently how contrast is, is gestured or preference, contrast and preference. Um, and then I showed you the example of but anyways earlier. So a discourse, uh, kind of pragmatic gesture in discourse where um, you're not pushing away an object, you're pushing away um, a previous utterance or something that you or someone else has said. And these are the expressions that I used to target each of these domains. So remember, I'm taking that idiom principle from corpus linguistics, where we're looking at multi-word units of oral language. And this is really how language behaves. So you'll notice that with but anyways and so anyways, you have this um, idiomatic chunk. This is how we use it in regular conversation. And uh, I'm looking at whether these lexical bundles, if you like these lexical chunks, have kind of gestural or 
uh, kinesic chunking that, that profiles that go along with them. And so in order to ascertain this, I build a multimodal profile to capture this linguistic and kinesic behavior for all of these and more utterances. Right, as I said, I use the, the Redhead Multimodal Archive. I'll give you a brief introduction um, or overview for those of you who aren't familiar with it yet. It's run by Mark Turner and Francis Steen and it's hosted at UCLA. And it's based on the Newscape Library of International Television News. It's massive, it has 400,000 plus hours of programming, which are crucially time aligned with um, closed caption text. So we have the multimodal signal with uh, a time stamped text uh, and the text is, is all provided for. So that's really critical for my research. It's still growing and it's multilingual, but I only use the, in the English section of it for now. This is what the search interface looks like. So like I said, critically, you can search uh, the text because of the, the time aligned transcripts. So here I've, um, I'm indicating a search that I did for on the one hand and on the other hand, with, for my study of contrast, uh, within um, 30 words of each other. So I wanted to find a binary pairing of those two fixed expressions. There are a couple things you can play with here, including the date and time. So I use this really as a way of limiting or maximizing the amount of data that, I, um, that was returned to me in the system. So that means if I was looking for an item that it was really high frequency, sometimes I only search over a 12 month period because that generated thousands and thousands of returns and I didn't need, I wasn't looking to annotate thousands and thousands. If it was lower frequency, uh, then I could search the whole archive, which goes back to 2006 to ensure that I gained enough search returns uh, to, act, to, to do what I wanted. The other thing I, I manipulated um, by trial and error early on was the networks and series. So you can select or unselect any of these. And you know, what's very important for my work is that I'm looking, that, I'm, that the instances that I'm annotating are from spontaneous conversation. And so in Red Hen, um, it captures newscasting, for example, which does not fit that spontaneous um, conversational profile that I'm looking for. So I took out anything that was scripted, uh, so not spontaneous, um, anything that was an ad, for example, or um, someone speaking only to a news camera with, with no audience or a dyadic conversation partner. So I stripped out all of those. Um, and that, uh, I'll get into, um, that's fairly labor intensive itself. Um, but what reduced the, the amount of labor that was required was uh, over time, knowing which networks and series delivered generally more of the kind of spontaneous data that I was looking for and uh, kind of saved me some work that way. And then you can, uh, so you run your search and you can also export uh, all of the data to a CSV file, which you can open uh, in Excel, for example. Uh, and that was also uh, saved a lot of work in setting up my, my data frame, which again, I'll get to in a sec. So this is what a search return interface looks like. If I put in on the one hand, on the other hand, um, then you can see it highlights those for me in bold. And what I can do is click on the video that's on your left hand side there and it'll play the video it'll jump me into that program about 10 seconds before the utterance and then i can manipulate if i want to go further back in the program but it's really i mean this is crucial to the whole workflow uh, is that you can search for text and then see this multimodal signal and uh to give you an idea of kind of how much culling of the instant that you know the returns i had to do i found generally um I had to search through four to five times the amount of text or the, the, the number of returns that I, you know, over and above what I needed in order to achieve enough um, or, you know, my target number. So if I was looking for 200, I generally clicked on uh, 800 to 1,000 videos. Um, and one couple of the other reasons for omitting the videos, for example, uh, were that um, television is really fond of that chyron that runs across the bottom of the screen and obscures people's hands and other parts of their body. So I had to discard a lot of that, even if it was an interactional scenario. So at the end of the day, uh, that's still uh, uh, there's still a manual event, um, a manual piece of the, the data collection. 
uh, I want to show you a data point. So if you clicked on one of those, you'd, you'd come up on something like this. This is for my contrast marking data, uh, and I'll just uh, play it once to give you a sense. But apparently, they like him on both sides. On the start, one hand, he, he believes in climate change, so they consider him a liberal. The other hand, uh, he doesn't believe in abortion, so they consider him a Republican. Okay, so that's just uh, you know a, a quick clip. That's the kind of um, instance that I would have annotated with that prototypical palm up on one hand and this nice use of lateral space. I mentioned that you can export all of this from all of those search returns from Red Hen, which is very handy. And so this really that formed the basis of my data frame. <clears throat> excuse me for annotation. So having run my search, I export it and then you can see here that it gives you what the target utterance was that you would that that was searched on. Uh, it gives you the keyword in context. So this is really important from a, a corpus linguistic perspective. I would use that surrounding context uh, to annotate for the linguistic variables. And then this is the column in which I would ascertain, you know, I, I would note whether this was a valid instance. So it met all the criteria. I could see the hands and upper body, it was interactional, unscripted, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, here I've, I've sorted on them, so they all look like they were valid. I always selected enough to do a random selection so that I, um, there was some distance from which data ended up in my data set, since I would have viewed it all ahead of time in order to decide whether it was valid. And then also crucial is that I could go back with this metadata and find that instance in Red Hen again very easily using the um, permanent link to that program. So this is kind of all the setup. And then we get into annotations. Now, I'm, I don't expect you to make any sense of this. This is just a, a sample of my data frame so that you can see that I take that um, exported file from Red Hen and then basically I add uh, columns to insert my manual annotations depending on the variables that I'm uh, examining. So uh, you were talking a little bit about annotations before the, the meeting began with some of you. Um, in my work, I started out using fairly standard gesture annotation methods. This is a form-based gesture analysis um, scheme that was developed at the Berlin Gesture Center. It features um, a form analysis for every kind of parameter. So you can look at, I'm gonna do this high up so you can see um, your hand configuration, whether it's a palm down or a palm up or you know, palm lateral, as well as various different configurations like points and fists. And then for movement and direction, kind of basically any way that these gestures normally um, are executed where you can have movement away from the body or towards the body or um, up or down, et cetera. And then you'll notice that movement type is kind of, these are the idealized forms that I've put here for you. So you might have somebody making a straight line or saying that they took a path that looked like this to get somewhere. So those are the kinds of movement type um, annotations that um, feature in this schema. Quite early on in this work, I found that this didn't allow me, this, um, this kind of annotation didn't fully allow me to do what I wanted to do. So gesture studies has often focused on iconic and referential gestures. So these are something like um, if you're describing, say, that there was a rug on your floor like this, and then the dog always sat right on top of it. Okay, so these take on an iconic form where here my forearm is a rug, you know, or I was driving down the street and then somebody cut in front of me. Okay, so you'd have that, those kinds of gestures um, are highly iconic. I'm looking at more abstract gestures that happen over the course um, of a conversation where you're not depicting an event like that, for example, with your gestures. And so what I found with this system was that it didn't accomplish what I wanted to specifically for the kinds of linguistic domains that I was looking at. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, so I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, for example, for aspect, uh, I used the, the kind of annotation for arc, which I showed you earlier. So that uh, gesture form is represented here in this form-based analysis. Um, but what you don't find is um, in aspect marking gestures is that zigzag, for example. 
So if you think about aspect being how the movement is, is really kind of chunked over time, what I wanted to explore was if somebody was continuing doing something, how many times were they continuing it? Um, and that comes out in the gesture. Uh, and so that's one of the pieces that I added to my annotation scheme. So the point here is just that I had to add um, variables that were specific to the linguistic domains that I was looking at. And that's not surprising because in fact, the form-based gesture system is designed to be a linguistic, but the kinds of things that I'm looking at um, are, um, are not a linguistic, they're entirely linguistic. Uh, so I'll get into how I um, develop, developed my own schema. Just to back up again to the linguistic form for a moment, I won't get into this in, in much detail. I took a, a standard linguistic, uh, corpus linguistic approach. And so I annotated, for example, for subject and person, um, animacy, various details about how the verb uh, occurred in the context. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but right now for today, I really wanna focus on the kinesic form because this is where my approach differs from that form-based approach. So I mentioned earlier that I was interested in um, how conventionalized gestures are uh, in there, or how conventionalized the occurrence of a gesture is with a specific linguistic utterance is more the thing. And so I measured what I called the degree of enactment. And so this was, this is a binary measure for whether uh, the body is kind of on or off with a specific utterance. Um, so it's really um, not what the body is doing, just whether it's active. Okay, so this becomes part of the profile of an utterance. And um, it'll, it tells us, for example, whether this gestural bundle that is prototypical for on the one hand, on the other hand, whether that occurs like every fifth time that we use it, uh, that we use that utterance, or whether we always do it when we say on the one hand, on the other hand. And we'll get to the findings in a second. But that's what that measure captures. So this is my first pass of, of the data. And then getting into the gesture annotations, again, I don't make, uh, want you to make sense of the whole thing. Uh, the high level parameters there, um, you'll note that some of them are the same as are in the form-based annotation scheme. And I've um, highlighted and italicized the ones that are my own. And you'll notice, for example, in the, in the top quadrant, symmetry and laterality. So if you remember, I'm looking at contrast and contrast is essentially a binary evaluation. And so I wanted to look at the role of the spaces on the side of our body, um, the role of lateral space in, in the expression of contrast, as well as whether the gestures that were performed in that space were the same on either side. Okay, so obviously with that prototypical one, they are the same. Um, it's quite hard to produce on the one hand and on the other hand with asymmetrical gestures. Um, but you'll see that this becomes relevant uh, in the findings as we explore other kinds of expressions of contrast. And then, like I was saying, so uh, kind of halfway down, you'll see action phases. Again, this is one of the measures that I used for the study of aspect because of, um, I wanted to capture how many, uh, or the segmentation in the interior of the event. Um, so for example, if somebody stopped something, did they stop it more than once? And if somebody was keeping going, did they keep going more than once? Um, and so this segmentation of the gesture stroke is what I termed action phases. So really the point here is that I targeted my gesture variables to things that through pilot studies I ascertained were important to the enactments in that specific domain. And for upper body, the annotations were kind of necessarily more coarse grained. Part of the reason for this is simply that from the perspective of kinesic affordances, there's a more limited range of things that you can do with your head than for example, with your hands. Um, and so while people might be able to, you know, tip their head all the way backwards, um, kinesically one can do that. That's not a kind of co-speech behavior that would, you would normally, normally see. So, um, yeah, there I annotated for head nods and tilts and turns and shakes. So the typical movements that we see there, shoulders moving up and down in a shrug form, eyebrow raising, torso um, moving and, and leans as well. And then we'll come back to the last variable that I noted here on the kinesic form annotations that, that will all end up contributing to this multimodal profile. 
And the last one is what I call partitioning. And really that's a, a way of measuring the division of labor between the different sets of articulators. So I looked at what degree, you know, looked at the contribution, whether it was gesture only, so only the hands were involved, or only the head was involved, or whether kind of everything kicked in and, it, and all of the articulators were moving in this utterance sequence. And this is what those schematic drawings on the right hand side are meant to indicate. So you have gesture only and then upper body only or whether everything was going at once. And the reason this was important to me because this because I'm, I'm was working on a testing a hypothesis about whether more subjective language it tends to be expressed more in the upper body. So I wanted to see what this distribution of labor uh, looked like. Okay, so uh, now we can get to some of the findings. Again, I'll keep this um, kind of fairly high level, not to get into all of the linguistic impact of this, but generally so that you can see how I'm using the annotations that I've just described um, to build the multimodal profiles. So I'll start with the annotations for on the one hand and on the other hand. So this kind of formed the basis of my largest corpus study for the contrast domain. So first, before I can get into exactly what this data show, I need to explain uh, the behavior of on the one hand, on the other hand, and on the other hand as linguistic utterances. So you'll see at the bottom, my nomenclature, so clever, for on the one hand, on the other hand, is O1H-O-O-H. Okay, so that in square brackets means that whole fixed, fixed expression. So that's one way that these, um, on the one hand and other hand, on the other hand, utterances can occur is when they're in this, this fully fixed expression. What happens though, is that you also frequently in spontaneous discourse find that uh, people uh, start with on the one hand and they don't finish their utterance with on the other hand. Instead, what they do is they use a small subset of other types of linguistic things uh, to finish the contrast. And so those types of things include but, and, but then, or at the same time. So you have on the one hand, da da da, but, or on the one hand at the same time. But that's a small set. So this is still a relatively fixed utterance, okay? Less fixed than the fully fixed kind of prototype, uh, but still relatively fixed. What's interesting is that for on the other hand, the pattern is very different. When people, um, so it's possible just to use on the other hand in discourse. And what happens in those cases is that people are trundling along in their discourse and they want to create a contrast. And so they just spring in with on the other hand, da da da. And the effect is that it creates a contrast with the entire piece of preceding discourse. And so what happens is that, that what's, what's noted there with the asterisk this entire, this preceding discourse is a wide open slot. There is very little regularity in what occurs there because it's just what people were talking about before they said on the, on the other hand. And this becomes, the, so I just wanna leave it at that. Those are the three kinds of construction types that you end up seeing with in, in this kind of within the, on the one hand, on the other hand family. And to come back to the kinesic signal, what you see here is that each of those structures has a very different profile in terms of hand shape. I don't want to get into the, the, what the, you know, the, my analyses or why, why some of these, why, why the particular hand shapes um, kind of adhere to the, a particular construction type. But I do want to just say that it's clear that there is some different identification um, between each of the structures and the kinds of hand shape that occur with them. And I'll, uh, we can come back to that at the end. So another way that I compressed the data was that I looked at these same three construction types and I looked at whether they were symmetrical, whether the kinesic enactment was symmetrical or lateral. And as you can see here from the results, on the one hand, on the other hand, was highly symmetrical and highly lateral. So that basically says people are using the same sign on each side of their body, whether or not that's a, a hand shape or a head tilt. Okay, they're using the same uh, sign on each side and well, and they're using each side. Okay, so I, I split those up. Either it was, um, I measured whether it was symmetrical and separately whether it was lateral because you could have on the one hand and then if it was a little bit later in the discourse, on the other hand, that would be a symmetrical form but not a lateral use of space to distinguish. So 
you can see then that, um, remember that that on the one hand, on the other hand is the most fixed and just on the other hand is the least fixed. And so what you see is that laterality com continues to play somewhat of a role for these, the two right hand expressions, but symmetry really drops off. So you don't have a symmetrical enactment with on the other hand. And this is one of my favorite findings because um, what we're seeing is that there's an iconic, an iconic relationship between, between how fixed the linguistic signal is and how fixed the body signal is. There's been a lot of talk about iconicity and gesture, but kind of not at this um, level, if you like, at this abstracted uh, level. Um, so the third way that I've compressed the data here um, is this body partitioning that I've talked about. So again, if you imagine from the waist up here, you have the light blue is gesture only, so just the hands are going, and the hash marks are gesture and upper body, so everything's going, and the upper body only here, there's just a little bit of it in the black. And again, what you see is that if people start an utterance with on the one hand, so either the left hand or center columns, they are mostly doing it in their hands, exclusively in their hands. But if they just do this on the other hand marking, they recruit their upper body um, to the tune of about 74% to mark on the other hand. So this to me really supports the hypothesis that this more uh, stanced um, subjective kind of material recruits the upper body. And we, we can talk about that a little bit more, but really at the highest level here, the take home is that each of these types of constructions or each of these structural subtypes um, have a different embodied profile. And so I did the same kind of data compression for other expressions of contrast. One of those was better than, worse than. And so you can see here, this also, you know, he's doing it so nicely, you know, um, when a data point like this falls in your lap, you just, um, you use it. <laughs> um, and so these were also characterized by a high degree of enactment. So 72% of the time that people are using better than or worse than, they're recruiting their body to do it. That was also highly symmetrical and highly lateral in a way that was very similar with that binary expression that on the one hand, on the other hand together. And you had gesture and upper body movement. Okay, so you're seeing here more upper body movement come in than we saw in the previous slides, which again suggests, and here this is uh, highly evaluative when you're comparing uh, two things. Um, and the upper body is, is more involved. And finally, if you can kind of see this, uh, this progression to even more subjective material, I looked at should I, shouldn't I? And so the very present of the presence of the first person here um, kind of drives subjectivity up. Uh, and it's also um, a hypothetical scenario. Okay, should I, shouldn't I is in an unreal kind of unattained as yet world. Um, this was actually quite a hard one to, to find in Red Hen, so I'm not looking at many data points. So this is uh, it's only 13. Um, but the pattern seems to be that people overwhelmingly use their heads and that the upper body is even more active than in the other uh, prior two utterances that I've shown you. But again, uh, you know, this kind of very, this should be, what should be jumping out at you by now is that there, that these utterance have, utterances have really conventionalized usage patterns um, that go beyond what the linguistic utterance is and include the body. And just to, to give you a little taste of another study that I did, I looked at a set of um, idiomatic fixed expressions that are in what's called a non-restrictive relative clause. So in English, that's which is good, which is fine, which is great, which is true. So these are all kind of uh, expressions we use to just make an aside, you know, make a comment in the discourse. And then we keep, you know, then we head back to the original uh, topic and keep going. And here I wanted to ask whether, again, the difference in the, that lexical item, so they're all in the same construction type, okay? The linguistic structure is the same, um, but with a different lexical item, we're expecting a difference in the embodied profile. And that is indeed what we saw, that the body is distinguishing, distinguishing these utterances from each other in a way that, um, that uh, a grammar or a dictionary could not do to this degree. So 
what we see here is for, um, which is true, is that people frequently use a, a you know, presentational, which is true, you know, they're, they're committing like that, whereas, which is fine, so this, this really gives you that, I mean, if you can hear it, you know, think of a teenager saying this, and that would kind of be the, the, the over-the-top version, which is fine, right? Um, but the point here is that uh, these are, are specific to a lexical item inside the same construction um, to a really high degree. So to close this, this section on the red hen, I just want to do, a, you know, basically a, a plus minus. I mean, so what the red hen gives us is really irreplaceable for this kind of research right now. You can search uh, using these time-aligned transcripts and you can search naturalistic data. So it, it gives us the ability to look at how people are doing this, um, you know, out in the real world in spontaneous conversation. And, spe and especially to target specific utterances. Okay, so I can target grammatical things, I can target highly stanced things, um, because it's all based on a text search. And I have to say that even the numbers that I've been looking at, so up to kind of 20, 50, a couple hundred instances of the same utterance, this exceeds the kind of analysis that has characterized um, studies of naturalistic data so far. But clearly from a corpus linguistic perspective, these numbers are still really quite low. And that's um, due to the manual, just the manual labor limits, the, the number of instances that um, you can kind of effectively get through and annotate. And so really, and Mark can speak to this a little bit, um, uh, at the end, there is a need to automate much more of the process and that's in the works. So really, we're looking at feeding the annotations back into the archive and developing tools to reduce the amount of manual labor, you know, some of which I've, I've described to you today, when using the red hen. And every gain there is, uh, you know, will improve the research capacity. So that's what I do with 2D data. And I want to give you a brief look at what I do with um, 3D data um, and kind of what that can contribute to this, this um, Kind of multimodal signal. And this is work that I'm doing with uh, a very good friend and colleague, Dr. Irena Mittelberg at the RWTH University um, in Germany, sorry, RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Uh, she is the director of the Nat Natural Media Lab and it, it was a very nice collaboration with the data management and data exploration team there as well. So what motion capture does is allows us to visualize the trajectories in 3D space and we can measure things that you can't uh, kind of annotate by observation alone, such as velocity and amplitude um, and distance. And then I'll get to what the, the goals were for the data engineers uh, in just a moment. First, I just wanna pause and show you what the setup looks like. So this is kind of a, a long room with the lab setup with um, infrared cameras, high speed and digital video cameras um, and participants are uh, you put, you know, motion capture markers on uh, certain spots on their on their body, which for us included the ones I've just pointed to in their chin and head. Um, so the upside is that it's a more controlled environment. Um, this is this is the lab, so there's no Chiron unhelpfully obscuring the hands at the bottom of the screen. But obviously, the downside is that um, you're kind of back to elicited conversation rather than naturalistic data. And so I found that the type of data that we gathered from a gesture perspective depended highly on how relaxed the speaker was um, doing an interview with me in this lab setup. Uh, so just to come back um, to, to this slide, you can see the, the participant in the right hand corner, that's just a regular, regular video recording. And then you can see the mocap movement trace uh, in, the, in the center of your screen there where the markers give us this um, beautiful rendering of what all of the movements were. And the ultimate goal of the data engineering team in all of this was to improve the mathematical and statistical analyses of, um, of 3D motion capture, sorry, 3D data streams so that they could identify patterns um, more quickly, more efficiently, and more accurately in their, in their stream. So, I did interviews with uh, North American exchange students in, in Germany when I was there, and we focused on the aspect marking gestures. And so, you know, the questions and the conversation that I drove was around habits that they had, for example, uh, because then you get into kinds of, you know, 
I always used to run those kinds of things. And, and that was the kind of data we were looking for. Um, we hand annotated the data in Elan, which is a standard video annotation software. But then the advantage of the mocap is that we could verify our, our annotations and use the um, mocap trace to kind of correct or to see better what the types of movement traces were. So that's how we did it with a, uh, from the linguistic perspective. So we were able to achieve a more precise form analysis. Um, and I'll get to the data engineering results in a moment. But just to give you an example here, uh, from the linguistic part of the study, on the left you see the participant and she made a really nice um, spiral gesture, which coincided with her explanation that she, um, she does run as a kind of regular thing in her life. Uh, and then on the right hand side, this was the arc gesture I showed you earlier. So this is a, a continuing um, event. She says, if I were to continue watching this TV series. Okay, so you can tell what her construal is uh, of this ongoing process by looking at the motion capture trace. And here, I hope that you can appreciate that in, you know, I've given you some clear examples, but when it was messier, it was easier to untie that mess looking at the motion capture trace than it was to untie it by looking at the gesture in slow-mo, for example, you know, on, on slow playback. Finally, in the collaboration with the data engineers, we fed these annotations um, to their system so they knew which ones we had annotated as arc gestures and spiral gestures, et cetera. And they trained their system on those to improve their pattern identification. I won't get into it at the um, algorithmic level, but very generally what they were able to say was that, um, or what they were able to do is correctly identify gestures which belonged to um, their own type. So they were diff correctly differentiating spirals from circles from straight gestures, for example. So here you see the spirals, circles, straight quadrants uh, across the top and down the side. And the, the dark blue is where the gestures are most similar. So the ones that I've highlighted here in that um, red, th those are the same gestures. Okay, so the cells that form the dark blue diagonal line in the middle are all zero and the same gesture. And what the color means is that gestures that are of the same type should have a low distance value, which is blue, and gestures that are different types should have a high distance value. And so what you can see is that generally they achieve this. Um, spirals are most similar to spirals, circles to circles, and straights to straights. Okay, so the model performed relatively well. But if you're looking closely, you can also see that there were exceptions, and here the gesture type spiral seems to be fairly close to straight. Um, so so clearly it needs um, some optimization. But this is really where uh, it's going, where they want to be able to um, do this pattern analysis efficiently and accurately in 3D data streams. So the brief plus minus on motion capture is that we can improve our form analyses and improve the um, data recognition systems. The challenges are that post-processing of mocap data is labor intensive, so those lovely traces took somebody a long time in the lab. Um, you lose the advantages um, and the, you know, the being able to look of, at naturalistic data. So I kind of think that we need, you know, some of the, the 3D annotation on a 2D signal, um, you know, so that I could rotate uh, a gesture better to be able to see it when I'm annotating in Red Hen, but um, that may be in the future for now. So kind of where does this leave us in terms of my, my research program? From a theoretical perspective, building these multimodal profiles shows the, the kind of the degree of conventionality and, and how close that interplay is between speech and the body signal and how specific that is to different linguistic utterances and different linguistic domains. So this has implications for multimodal language theory. Um, and also I think, you know, possible implications for language teaching and certainly for language documentation. And Finally, one of the areas that I'd like to apply my research is uh, human computer and interaction. I feel like kind of this is, um, you know, this is the next, uh, you know, beyond language pedagogy. These are the beings that we need to teach this kind of multimodal language to. Uh, so I'm in touch on the, in the, on the top there on the left um, is a lab at Simon Fraser University that I'm um, kind of starting to be in touch with. And they're working on an embodied conversational agent uh, that has the capacity for, um, at least producing empathy and understanding empathy, but they haven't looked at the body yet. And I think that if we don't do this and integrate it at this point as the systems are being developed, 
uh, you know, I kind of think that in 20 years, when we're all checking out at the supermarket with avatars in our, you know, um, faces, uh, that they what we will have ended up with impoverished human um, commuter human computer interactions because there won't be this kind of um, uh, authentic body signal involved. Uh, and I'd say the same about game animation. For any gamers among you, procedural animation is also impoverished in this way. And I've started to talk to um, Bioware, which is a video game uh, company here in Edmonton, uh, about um, how we can implement some, implement some of this research into their procedural animation systems. Uh, I want to thank Mark, especially for the invitation and also for all the work uh, on Red Hen with Francis Steen, uh, my supervisor, Sally Rice, and also all of you for your attention. Thank you. So, Jennifer, shall we stop sharing your screen? To yeah, with? then I can see you. Yes. Start it again, of course. Yeah. Um, hang on. Uh, there we go. If I stop share. Oh, How's that? Yeah. And uh, for you, those of you in cyberspace, if you have a question to ask, please just let me know that in chat and I'll call on you. The uh, floor is open for questions. Uh, I'll start with the comments since you asked me to. Uh, Tim, Tim, are you, do you have a question, Tim? Okay, so the comment is, uh, and we really appeal to uh, you in the future as the emerging scholar to solve all of this, <laughs> that long ago in the natural sciences, the, the idea of sharing your data and your annotations was established as uh, a disciplinary commandment, a disciplinary expectation, and that you would do the work to, to make it so that your data were shared and your annotations were shared in a smooth, fashion, the data did not belong to you. After all, it was funded by salaries and grants and things like that. So the lab, even going back a century, the lab book for physics or the uh, bio uh, chemistry or something, it, it all had to be shared. Mm -hmm. And the way Red Hen got started was that in the 2000s, I saw early 2000s, I saw genomics uh, using the internet. Uh, to put all of the data in one spot and then everybody shared everything and somebody in Australia would say, hi, I've got this part of it. And somebody in South Korea would say, I've got this part of it. And if we only had this, so it moved very, very quickly. The problem we have uh, endemically in the humanities and the social sciences is um, when people annotate data and gather data, they often just keep it. Um, so, for example, Elan is used in gesture studies to annotate frame by frame these nice source of uh, gestures, but then it tends to sit on somebody's laptop and five years later, maybe they write an article about it that just has the slightest summary of the annotation of the data and gives you the results. So Red Hen has tried to build and has built a way to incorporate annotations in Elan, the .eaf file, that's the extension, back into Red Hen. So if you're tagging Red Hen data, all those annotations come back into Red Hen so all other researchers can see them. And uh, we've made a rapid annotator. If you're using the rapid annotator, which isn't for very, very fine grain annotation, but for rapid, uh, grosser uh, annotation, those are done natively in Red Hen, so you don't even have to ingest the annotations back into Red Hen. The minute you annotate, it's in Red Hen. And of course, the person doing the annotation in the lab doing the annotation is marked so that you can filter out the ones that you don't want and so on. But this is a huge project to find a way for multimodal communication, for the annotations and the data compressions and all the great kind of work you've done to be reincorporated the way genomics uh, did it. And a while back in Brazil, I think it was about five years ago, I made a website or a Google doc called Metadata Mothership. And an analogy between a server that in the Bay Area was called The Well. This was in the 1970s. The Well was in Marin County. It was awesome and you could go there and get things. And, I mentioned that we need a kind of metadata mothership so the stuff can come back up to the mothership. So I've just shared that 
um, not only with you, but with a lot of other people in the room and so on. This is a very high level uh, <clears throat> disciplinary change that is needed and a data science conundrum. How do we cultivate inside the humanities and the social sciences the kind of obligations towards sharing data annotations and tools that have been in the uh, natural sciences for about 20 years. Uh, so I, this is being recorded. I appeal to all of those watching this recording to write to me, Mark Turner, uh, about how to participate in, in the creation of the metadata mothership. Okay, question. Uh, this is Fred Belcavello from Brazil, FriendNet. Hi, Fred. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I let pass, but in the end, what was the amount of data that you have used for each of the phenomena that you have been approaching? Yeah, um, for aspect, it was 250, uh, but that's split over five verbs. So I looked at 50 of each. Uh, for on the one hand, on the other hand, it was 200. And for the discourse ones, I kind of took a breadth rather than depth approach. So I looked at 20 each kind of of 20 discourse markers. Um, so the, uh, <clears throat> yeah. And the, the visual analysis of the movements, Sorry? the visual analysis of the movements are something that consumes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. you not in a manual way, not an automatic way, right? Sorry, can you say it again? I didn't catch it. Uh, to, 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 to make the analysis of the, the visual data, yeah. something that's very difficult to make, uh, to multiply this for uh, yeah, you have to do of it. data. You do it's, 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 yeah, it's really time consuming. So, um, I, you know, I, it's, yeah, I feel kind of half stuck between using big data archives, but yeah. I'm still working in a, in a really small data way. The only kind of defense at this point is that even looking at 200 is vastly, you know, is a, a kind of one leap or, you know, it's a step forward from the anecdotal data that has really, um, really up until about five years ago, uh, you know, in the descriptive world in gesture, you described your favorite examples. You know, I mean, you described the prototype all the time. So even in looking at 200, I'm trying to abstract away from looking at that prototype. You know, I mean, in, in Roman times, they knew that if you wanted to, you know, say that you were, you know, contrasting something, you did this. So, I mean, this, this is kind of, you know, part of the embodied experience of being a human on, on earth and a, a linguistic one at that. Um, I wanted to find out kind of, you know, over and above that really anecdotal level um, when people weren't on a stage when they're just using regular conversation and you saw things like just really subtle hand tilts as well. So it wasn't all kind of, I didn't look at 200 instances of this, you know, I looked at, um, yeah, that still was the prototypical form, but there was a lot of variation uh, within, uh, constrained variation uh, within it, um, which you could see with 200 instances, but you'd be able to really get into if you looked at 5,000 or 10,000 or, you know, so, I mean, that's really where this needs to get to. Yeah, so for data science, um, it's, we're pretty good now for multimodal communication at getting lots of examples of something that you can characterize mm -hmm. grammatically or lexically, right? So it's wonderful that the text is actually there to help you find, find things. And uh, it's frequently the case that for a particular kind of construction, I'll hit the button on the grammatical tagging and boom, you get 100,000 hits, yeah. but then you drown in them. Whether well, you drown in them and out of your 100,000, 20,000 of them are actually ones that don't have the chiron and the cameras on the speaker and you can, you know, all of this. So the next stage is how do you filter automatically and, yeah. okay, well, if it's, if it's text, then we already have 50 years of natural language processing tagging. And so you can use it on the analysis and tag and improve it side. But for the visual, for gesture, we're just not in, I mean, any that, that far along at all. So the bleeding edge of this is making tools, red hens, making tools. And can I, can I jump in, Mark? 
the, the, you know, this degree of enactment that I'm talking about. So, you know, within really within the last three or four years of conference talks and, you know, talking to other people who are doing this, that's how recent, even looking at whether, you know, looking at both the ones that have this action when there's a, a speech utterance and when there is, when, when the body's not involved. I mean, we need to know that too. And so even just identifying the parameters that we need to start finding ways to automatically annotate, you know, or, you know, automatically, um, you know, do computationally, uh, you know, arriving at the right parameters is, you know, we're still right on the edge of that. So for trivial, but really significant example, four years ago, when we were kind of starting this, we had a manual tagging team and computer classifier team working on timeline gestures. This was the, uh, mainly the Spanish uh, team headed by Cristobal Pagan Canavas and Javier Valenzuela and Inez Ulza. So we found lexical patterns that would produce timelines. That was great. So you're drowning in lots of examples. And they would manually go through them. But half the time, there was no person on the screen. Because, of course, it was voiceover or the hands were cut or whatever it was. But the machine classifier people said, well, we can make a classifier in an hour that will tell you whether or not there's somebody on the screen. So we did and tagged for that and then filtered it out. So what that means is the manual uh, quality control human being looking at whether this is a valid instance suddenly doesn't have to look at half of the examples, right? But that, that really is, that's where the state of the art was like four years ago. So we, we have a lot of, it's very clear that the discipline has a lot of work going forward on making it possible for somebody who gets 100,000 hits actually to deal with it. Now, now what do you do, right? That's, that's where we Yeah, go. and then you, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, question from cyberspace, anybody? Question or comment from the room, anybody? Let's all thank the speaker. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you all.